In this recording, we'll shift away from looking at the judiciary and the court system as a whole and really try and emphasize uh, the underlying nature of judicial reasoning. So really this whole recording is about the process itself, how judges go about interpreting and really making and declaring what the law is. Uh, we'll analyze their uh, neutrality and the impartiality that they have towards cases and but we will also uh, examine the underlying influences on judicial reasoning. I'll also discuss uh, criticism of judges that is the discourse uh, among people in society and in the media about the position of judges and of particular decisions that judges make. So a quick recap on the separation of powers doctrine. As uh, I've analysed and discussed in earlier recordings, uh, our contemporary Western model uh, style of governance is really a, a shift away from having uh, an absolute power vested in one individual or body and really the, the process of holding and using power is split amongst the three arms of government. We have the legislature, the parliament goes about making the law, the judiciary or the courts uh, go about interpreting what the law is and the executive arm of government goes about actually applying it and enforcing the law. Now in relation to the judiciary, really that's a little bit simplistic. Uh, the underlying doctrine here is that look, are they, are they really simply interpreting what the law is and following the uh, express or implied will of parliament or are they making law? And I, I guess in answering these, uh, these questions, I do have to express uh, that these challenges have actually, and these questions have been asked for many centuries. Uh, judges and I guess uh, legal philosophers have wrestled with how judges actually go about this process and what their position is or ought to be in terms of um, making law as opposed to merely interpreting what the law is. So in trying to unpack that, we're going to start with a normative question. Fundamentally, what's the problem? Why is it, uh, or do some consider it to be wrong for judges to go about uh, making law? And really, uh, the, the challenges with this can be di divided into to three, um, three categories. And the first one is really to do with uh, representation. Judges aren't elected, or at least not in our Westminster system. And so the, uh, I guess the, the Parliament, which is represented, uh, somehow draws its legitimacy as the, um, as the body that expresses uh, and encapsulates the will of the people. The second of these broad categories uh, is really to do with uh, ideology, and the, it, but it relates very much to the, to the first uh, difficulty or problem in that judges as people have their own ideologies, they have their own values and beliefs, and they're individuals. So that rather than expressing in, uh, in a body such as the Parliament, where um, many people come together, and really it's, it's majority wins, only a small number of judges, in other words a small number of people in society who aren't elected, um, can go about um, you know, expressing their particular values and ideologies in, the, in that lawmaking process. And partially there's a transparency thing as well, that we as electors, we're really exposed to what the underlying values of uh, MPs are through the uh, electoral process. Uh, people present policies and they present themselves and we examine those, weigh them up and then choose to vote one way or the other. With judges though, that system the structure is much more opaque that we don't necessarily know what the particular ideology of particular people are as they go and move um, into the judicial role. And certainly the system we have now where judges are essentially appointed uh, at the, by the government of the day, that process in itself is not particularly transparent. That the uh, people in society don't necessarily know what the values of particular persons are when they're appointed by the government into those roles. Now the third category of, of problem here is, is really a structural one and it's to do with the adversarial nature of our system. Uh, a system 
and certainly in the, the civil sphere, requires two parties who can't determine amongst themselves what the law is to produce uh, evidence and to create legal arguments go to court for a judge to then determine one way or the other who's right who's wrong now fundamentally this process is essentially the judge at some stage after the particular um, issue has arised and for anyone that's ever been exposed to the court system this can be a very very long time after the particular um, uh, event that caused the legal dispute can happen. In other words, the process can take many months or years. Then the two parties come to court and the judge is essentially declaring what the law was back at the time that that particular event happened. In other words, it's retrospective. And this is really problematic in that the law in some ways um, can't be declared ahead of time. In other words, judges can only determine a, a, a case and determine what the law uh, was after the fact. Now, Parliament, certainly we accept, can pass retrospective laws. In other words, pass uh, legislation through uh, the appropriate process and just simply backdating it. And, and we accept that Parliament has the power to do that. Um, however, largely, we, um, we as a society ex also believe that retrospecting retrospectively creating laws in order to particularly to criminalize certain behaviors that may have been lawful at the time is really one of the hallmarks of tyranny and so fundamentally that is a problem with judges making law because it's absolutely um, integral to that process that it's declaring the law at a later stage what it was earlier on and so thus it's generally accepted that the role of judges in terms of their power to make law um, ought to be limited in some way. It ought to be um, restricted or curtailed in that Parliament is the appropriate body to go about making what the law is, as it's the body that represents the will of the people. One of the defining features of our system is that judges make law according to the doctrine of precedent. That is, wherever a decision has been made, based on a certain set of facts and particular reasoning associated with those facts. When the case comes before the court, or in particular before an inferior court, uh, to where that original decision is made, then the later judge is bound to follow the reasoning of the original decision. That means that similar cases must be treated the same way uh, throughout, uh, throughout time. And so really, when we think about that, it can almost be expressed as a very mechanical process. We're just simply applying a set of objective rules to a particular uh, set of factual circumstances, finding the appropriate um, uh, reasoning from earlier cases, uh, and coming up with the exact decision, or the, using the same reasoning to that particular set of facts in order to effectively resolve this particular dispute at hand. Now, this system of following like cases, in other words, following the reasoning of earlier decisions where the facts are the, are the same or very, very similar, and doing so in an objective way, works really well uh, where the facts are the same in particular cases. However, from time to time, novel cases do arise. In other words, from time to time, judges are faced with a factual situation where the law for these particular facts has never actually been considered before. Uh, in other words, there's something of a gap in the law, and here I'm referring to both the common law and uh, the statutory rules as well. Now the process of filling in uh, the gaps in, the, in this way uh, has really been referred to as what we call the declaratory model in our, in our system of the common law. In other words, when faced with a novel situation where the facts have never come up uh, in the past, judges look to the common law and declare that the common law has all, always and already existed and is in place. It's just that it hasn't yet been discovered. Now this is 
is really something of a fiction uh, when judges are essentially declaring uh, what the common law is or was since time immemorial and then using that and applying it to the set of novel facts. Now this concept of uh, the declaring what the common law is and always has been in novel situations uh, has been the subject of much criticism over the years. In fact, Lord Reed described it uh, as a simple fairy tales. Um, and a, a quote where he was speaking um, excurially was, those with a taste for fairy tales seem to have thought that in some Aladdin's cave there is hidden the common law in all its splendor, and that on a judge's appointment there descends onto him or her knowledge of the magic words open sesame. But terrible decisions are given when the judges muddled the passwords and the wrong door opens. We don't believe in fairy tales er anymore. Now essentially Lord Reed is echoing the sentiments of the legal realist movement um, which is very much centered on the, on the American, the US legal system. And that idea that look get real, judges make law and from time to time in novel situations the judiciary pushes the law in a new direction. And so clearly there's something of a cultural difference there. In our system we consider judges to be impartial and only filling in the gaps uh, as in their particular role, whereas um, uh, American jurisprudence can be very much seen that judges are somehow the upholders of rights. Certainly the works of the uh, legal philosopher Ronald Dworkin was very much centred around this idea that judges do need to declare what the law is, but they do so in order to, to you know, really follow this particular agenda, which is to uphold the rights of citizens. So then if we accept the proposition that judges ought not to make law, uh, but we also accept that from time to time, uh, particular novel situations do come up and gaps in the law will appear. And we also accept that judges uh, consider themselves bound by stare decisis, that is the doctrine of precedent. In other words, they are bound to follow decisions in superior courts where the facts uh, are the same. Then we have to take these propositions and in examining what judges actually go about doing, well, we have to look at well, what actually makes uh, a ca the case at hand similar to previous cases that judges may feel compelled by the doctrine of precedent to decide in a certain way. What's the process that they go through in determining whether uh, the case in front of us is the same as an earlier one? And there's really two, uh, two ways to go about um, examining this. And the first is to look at how uh, judges go about framing the factual situation. In other words, comparing the facts in front of us, looking at the previous uh, decisions and determining whether they're sufficiently similar. The second is in terms of framing the law itself. In other words, which part of the law is going to apply in this particular set of facts? And whether or not the previous cases with similar facts, um, whether the reasoning is appropriate to follow uh, in this novel situation. And this process is known as distinguishing cases, and it's the um, the primary means by which uh, inferior courts can really go about circumventing uh, the doctrine of precedent. A really good case for demonstrating uh, this distinguishing early decisions uh, on the facts is Thornton and Tulane Parking. This is an English case um, that arose in the late 60s when car parking ticket machines started to, to, um, to, to really started to be used. Uh, and in Thornton, um, a well-known trumpeter, musician, had gone into one of these then newfangled car parking um, establishments, taken a ticket, and driven in, and then at some stage later there was uh, an accident of, of some, dis some description. And the, the issue before the court was whether or not the terms of an exclusion clause that was printed on a sign just inside the car park would apply or not. And Lord Denning, who was master of the roles at, uh, at that time, uh, had a, a quite a famous, very well written judgment in Thornton. And 
he went through some of the earlier ticket cases in contract law and he said look none of these cases really apply uh, for tickets that are issued by some form of machine, an automatic machine because when you pay your money you get a ticket there's no negotiation, you can't refuse it, you can't get your money back uh, he even simply phrased that, that you can protest at the machine, even swear at it, but it will remain unmoved. And so, from Lord Denning's um, reasoning, that idea that when you get the ticket, you're committed, you're absolutely committed to the contract at that point, you can't go back. And so, as a result, this distinguishes all of the earlier cases where you would get a ticket by paying a person. In other words, the facts are sufficiently similar for this to be a novel situation and uh, in that situation Lord Denning is declaring uh, what the law is. And so in the case of Thornton, the fact that the exclusion clause was printed on a sign beyond where the person gets the ticket uh, means that uh, it's too late and they're not con considered to be included in the contract at the time of formation, which is when you get the ticket. That is, the earlier ticket cases, cases are distinguished on the facts. Now some other cases where the decision, or in this case a pair of decisions, differed in terms of how the courts looked at the, at the facts in those cases were the Australian Conservation Foundation cases. Now the first of these went to the High Court in 1980 where um, the ACF was trying to, um, to to determine whether they had standing in order to try and uh, preclude uh, a tourist resort being built in Yapoon. And so, and so this idea of standing is really the ability for a party to bring the action in the first place. And so there the High Court, uh, I guess very conservatively said, look, even um, you're an environmental organisation, but you don't have some form of special interest in these proceedings. It's merely a, an intellectual or emotional concern, unlike uh, people in the vicinity. Um, and as a result, um, and the fact that there's no damage to that particular organisation, you don't have standing. Now, interestingly, uh, ten years later, uh, towards the end of the 80s, the AC have tried again. Uh, now, this time. It was uh, to do with the export of wood chips, in other words, the logging of uh, indigenous forests to um, uh, as a resource in order to um, to sell overseas. Now, there, though, interestingly, the federal court did say that the ACF had a, a special interest to litigate in relation to these forests, and um, the judge there distinguished on facts. First of all, that the um, forests uh, were part of a, a national. Uh, scheme or it's a, of a national interest rather than being a specifically a local one. Uh, second, that there was significantly increased concern about the environment since the first case there during the 80s. From the start to the end of the 1980s, there was a big shift in public opinion. Um, thirdly, the fact that, that the ACF by this stage was also a major important national body and that it could be uh, seen as an organisation that could represent the public interest. Um, and also, it had actually done a lot of work in this area. It produced, the ACF had produced a whole number of reports and submissions in relation to the logging of uh, native forests. And so, unlike the first ACF case, the, the judge here said, look, actually, yes, you, can, you do have standing in order to bring an action. Even though, fundamentally, they're just two uh, environmental interest uh, cases, and it's the, the exact same organisation. Uh, in that second case, the judge distinguished the first on the facts. Now, I guess another way of distinguishing cases uh, from uh, that would otherwise have been precedents is by framing the law in a different way. And that is, it's uh, examining the facts of the case in, in um, front of a particular judge and really asking a different legal question. Um, that is, which part of the law is going to apply to these particular set of facts. Now the example that, um, that's uh, on the slide is, the, is an English case again uh, of Brown. For those that continue with their legal education, uh, you'll be exposed to, the, uh, to this case at some stage later in the, the criminal law modules. 
Brown is to do with consent, and in particular consent to uh, assault and assault occasionally bodily harm. And it, um, the facts in Brown were that a, a group of men were engaging in some quite extreme forms of sadomasochistic um, sexual acts. And it went before the courts, the English courts of, uh, of appeal, and the House of Lords had to decide, well, in this situation, can you consent to, the, uh, to assault in this particular way? Because consent is usually a defense to, to assault otherwise. Um, a uh, doctor performing surgery on you would be c committing some sort of assault or grievous bodily harm. Uh, also, contact sports, uh, boxing, playing rugby league, and certainly even um, you know, most forms of consensual sex would all be deemed to be an assault on the person. Now, the interesting thing about Brown is that the judges in the House of Lords went about expressing what the underlying legal challenge or question was in quite a different way. Uh, Lord uh, Munstall, uh, for example, in the minority, framed the question as, well, should the law of assault be extended to create some new offence of sadomasochism? There, he decided that no, no, it shouldn't, and, and would, uh, would have quashed the conviction, that, well, had he not been in the, main, in the minority. Lord Templeman, though, framed the question as, well, can you legally consent to sadomasochism? He decided that no, no you couldn't, and thus upheld the conviction. And so I guess the interesting there is that, look, these two judges have come to completely opposite decisions, and yet each is still able to say that, well, they've followed the rule of precedent in regards to the relevant law. In this case, Lord Templeman is, is talking about the law involving consent, and Lord Munster is talking about the law regarding assault. So after examining the different methods by which judges can avoid earlier precedents, that, that is by framing the facts or by framing the law in a, a particular way, I'll turn now to the, uh, to the concept of in neutrality and impartiality. Now really, the, the basis of impartiality is really just not taking one side or the other. And in our legal system, judges really expected to act impartially and not according to their own personal preference, uh, not according to their own personal moral convictions or according to their religion. Even, in fact, not according to their own concept of what uh, justice is, and I guess, in the abstract, but really according to what, fundamentally, the law is. Now, much like the declaratory uh, myth that I explored earlier, arguably this is something of a legal fiction. That is, judges always bring uh, a part of themselves to every decision that they decide upon. And so when we're examining impartiality uh, as a concept in terms of judicial reasoning, it's, uh, it's really separated into two, two broad areas. Firstly, it's whereby a judge looks objectively at the, at the facts in front of her or him and makes a decision based on those facts alone. In other words, the judge is not to bring their own, uh, I guess, personal loyalties or bias, connections, financial interests, uh, and bring those to the court and, and have them in some way influence the, the outcome of a particular matter. Now, um, certainly if there, there is any sort of hinted bias in terms of financial uh, connection to the matter at, at hand, judges are, are required to disqualify themselves from a particular proceeding. And this can also be um, more so than just there actually being some form of connection. It's also whether or not the public would consider that there may be some form of connection between uh, the particular judicial officer and the, the matter at hand. So an example, the Palm Island death and custody case, uh, something of a um, a very large political issue in the state of Queensland uh, after there was a riot in Palm Island in 2004. The coroner, the state coroner who was appointed to conduct an inquiry uh, into that death in custody had to step down after it, it became clear that he was not considered to be impartial. Even though in that particular case the, um, the actual factual situations which are involved him uh, socialising at some stage with the lawyers on Palm Island and also uh, 
uh, he had dismissed earlier in previous um, matters complaints against uh, Sergeant Hurley, who was the, one of the officers involved um, in that particular death in custody case. And so the second area, um, so uh, leaving aside being objective about the particular facts, is also being impartial um, in not bringing your own personal social background and experiences into a particular matter. Now this is clearly very, very hard. In fact, arguably it's impossible. A person will always bring their own cultural, social and um, personal identity uh, in order to conduct themselves in any professional endeavour. Now from the outset, I do have to state that this is probably the most difficult uh, part of this subject. And so here I'm going to present a, a dozen or so concepts, but these concepts, um, they're, they're quite difficult ones. They're ones that philosophers and judges have rankled with for a very long time, hundreds if not thousands of years. Now. You might note that the, the pie graph is on, on the slide in front of you. Uh, each of these concepts ends with the suffix ism. Now that's one way I, I think a uh, helpful way to sort of group these together is to think of these all as, as isms. Each, each one of which is, uh, is a certain sort of school of thought or a, a collection of theories, an umbrella um, heading for uh, certain concepts. Now the pie chart itself which um, has seven on it. It's by no means exhaustive. That's it. There are many, many more perspectives or categories than what you see in the slide. Uh, here, as this is as an introductory level subject, I'm going to sort of introduce you briefly to a few of these, maybe about a dozen, and I do hope that you'll sort of explore these in more depth both throughout the subject and later in your academic career. Also, they're things that you might want to re-examine uh, later on in your both your professional and indeed your personal lives. And so the first of these broad areas um, uh, largely flow from the political sphere. So uh, the first two on the slide, this idea of conservatism as opposed to, I guess, progressivism. Um, it's something that you can really be demonstrated, but when you look at uh, the political system, uh, we hear the terms left-wing and right-wing. Left-wing often being synonymous with this idea of, of progress, that idea that we ought to be giving more rights to previously disenfranchised groups in an effort to make our system better. Whereas conservatism uh, really runs the other way. Conservatives really um, associate with that idea that, look, things have always worked okay. It's, uh, our system is not perfect. And yes, from time to time things do need to change, but they shouldn't change dramatically, they shouldn't change radically. Um, by and large our system works. And certainly in Australia we associate the uh, conservative side of politics with the, uh, the Liberal Party. Um, the, I describe it as the capital L Liberals, whereas the Labour Party and the Greens are historically and traditionally been more on the left of politics. And this plays out in debates uh, such as, uh, for example, the push towards uh, recognition of uh, gay marriage in the lesbian and gay communities. That idea that the on the left of politics that we ought to be pushing towards giving rights to these minority groups that have previously been repressed. Whereas a lot of the sort of social conservative um, side of politics is really basically saying that, that look, we already have a system, we have the system of marriage and it doesn't need to change. And again, a lot of these things flow from culture too, that idea that uh, social conservatism is often uh, bundled and tied up with, um, with religious uh, perspectives as well. Now the next term I want to explore a little is this concept of liberalism. This is a, a very broad term, it's an umbrella term to describe many theories and theorists. Um, but Fundamentally, liberalism and liberal theory uh, is about people, the individual person, really being free to pick and choose um, for them what makes a good life. And so uh, as part of that and having that freedom very much at its core, um, a lot of things flow from that that a lot of, but not all, of liberal theorists have in common, that idea of um, the, the freedom and autonomy of the individual. Uh, individual rights 
Trump and collective rights, uh, private property is a pretty common theme, um, democratic forms of governance, yeah, but also limited government intervention in terms of the curtailing of those individual rights. And so how this can be expressed can also be thought of as a continuum. So uh, I guess on one end of the spectrum, those very, very, very far, um, uh, far individual right uh, aspects to liberalism, um, libertarianism, uh, also known as the works of people like Robert Nozick, really hold that things like taxation is really just theft. Uh, the government ought to have no role in regulating the individual life of citizens. Uh, as an example, if people want to do drugs, uh, then the state ought not to take a position on that. Really the only role of government is to uh, police, to prevent citizens from doing terrible things to each other, and to have a military in order to defend that society from outside uh, forces. Whereas uh, I guess there are, um, um, on the other end of that continuum, there are theorists such as John Rawls, who believe that, well, you know, that, that you know, ideal situation of people um, being absolutely free isn't really a reflection of reality. To be honest, we really do have to put certain structures in place. We need to have a, a, a minimal, a basic level of education and healthcare and so on in order for people to truly be able to pick and choose what they want to do with their lives. It does accept that we do need to have some form of minimal welfare system in order to really have some form of a, a level playing field. Very, very, very basic um, level. But then for people to go beyond that and to succeed in the areas that they want to. And I think also a part of um, liberal uh, theories and theorists is that idea that people can both uh, choose to go and succeed in certain areas or they can choose not to. Um, and that's a, a very, very powerful component of uh, most of the theories of liberalism. So the next group of ideologies that may guide judges in making uh, judicial determinations flow from morality and ethics. And so I'll begin with, uh, I guess, loosely the ethical uh, framework of relativism, that idea that look, whatever uh, happens in a particular culture really determines what right or wrong is. For example, in Australian culture, uh, it's seen as perfectly normal and acceptable uh, to drink alcohol. And intoxication and um, the consuming of, of alcoholic beverages is very much not considered to be a bad thing. Whereas in other cultures, say um, Saudi culture, uh, this, this is considered to be some form of taboo. And so that idea of cultural relativism, and the reason why it's difficult as a, I guess, an ethical framework, is that there's no real way of weighting these against each other. What we do in our culture is the right way. What you do in your culture, well, it's the right way for you. One of the difficulties with that in terms of um, judicial reasoning is that really there's nothing to offer judges any any sort of moral insight to a particular action other than comparing whether it's part of uh, our culture or it's not. Now uh, the next broad category of, of ethical and moral theories um, is also an umbrella term in itself. It's this idea of consequentialism. That is, an action is good or bad depending on what the result is. We don't care about what people necessarily do in particular acts uh, in, in, within themselves. What we do care about is what's the what's the fundamental result from this, and that. Um, is most famously um, expressed in the works of Jeremy Bentham in the area of consequentialist um, theory known as utilitarianism. And Bentham's theory is really that look, any particular uh, act or action is, is moral, is a good thing, if it leads to uh, the greatest amount of happiness for the greatest good of people. Now, uh, clearly there are some uh, initial problems with us trying to d define what, it, what you mean by the greatest good and define what you mean by the greatest number. Uh, and those, uh, that analysis and discussion, I, I, it's not my place to go into in a great deal of depth here. Uh, 
uh, it's just really important to note in terms of judicial reasoning that this is a very powerful uh, mechanism for judges in trying to weigh up uh, decisions to really look at what the fundamental consequences of a particular decision may or may not be. Um, but also note, in terms of judicial reasoning, when having this utilitarian ideology, judges, though, are really in the worst position to go about investigating what a particular set of results may or may not be. They've got no powers to go out into the world in our system and actually look at things for themselves. They can only um, really determine cases based on the evidence that's placed uh, in front of them. And when that evidence isn't placed in front of them, then they can't really accurately uh, determine the, the greatest consequence. And judges aren't all knowing that in many ways they can't see what the final result of a particular decision is going to be. So the next area of um, ethical and moral frameworks that I want to explore for a bit is the idea of contractarianism. Uh, it's really, each of these is built around the idea of the social contract. So for example, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who wrote uh, during the period of the English Civil War, um, his idea of, of a social contract is that each of us has to essentially cede all of our claims to sovereignty to a separate entity, an all-powerful uh, sovereign. Hobbes' preferred form of sovereign was uh, a monarchy, and that that's an absolute necessity in order to prevent continuous civil war. Now, a more sophisticated uh, form of social contract was one proposed by uh, the American philosopher John Rawls. His concept of uh, the social contract is really in the context of trying to determine what are appropriate systems and appropriate principles to put in place in a society in order to really reach some, some form of just outcome. Rawls' uh, social contract theory is very much tied in with the concept of liberalism that I discussed earlier and his his theory is really based around a, something of a thought experiment. He takes this, what we describe as a state of nature, that he calls the original position, and he asks a person to think about, well, if I didn't know who, I, who my parents were going to be, if I didn't know whether I was going to be rich or poor, poor, tall or short, healthy or um, slightly sick, if I was going to be male or female, or, and if I didn't know whether I was going to be in a major, 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 <laughs> or male or female, or in a majority ethnic and or religious group, or not. So assuming that I don't, don't know what group I'm going to end up in, what would an appropriate um, set of rules, principles and systems be uh, in order to really let people pick and choose what they're going to do with their lives? So what Rawls is really saying is that well, we need to have certain structures, we need to give people, um, and I mentioned this previously, that idea of minimum education, healthcare, uh, freedom of, of movement, freedom to, um, to earn and to have uh, private property. It's really basically creating a system that justifies um, these structures in a liberal framework from this idea of what he calls this veil of ignorance. Rawls' theory is uh, both complex and comprehensive, uh, and it's r really one of the um, one of the most important um, theories of political philosophy to come from the 20th century. Now, the final uh, four theories to do with ethics and morality that I, I want to explore in this recording, I sort of loosely put these in the category of non-consequentialist um, schools of thought. Uh, largely because I couldn't think of words ending in ism to describe each of them. So um, I'll start first with the works of Immanuel Kant. Now um, Kant's theory is really based around this idea of duty and his uh, his works are really um, about creating universal rules and that is when looking at any particular action that a person is t to take to really be able to, to think to oneself, if everyone did this, would the world work? 
And to some extent, this is just a restatement of the uh, Christian philosophy, which is uh, do unto others as you would have them uh, do unto you. And that idea that you can't treat other people as a means to an end, that every person is an end unto themselves. And I guess in its simplest sense, in terms of judicial reasoning, um, judges and magistrates use this all the time. Look, hey, if you did this and we didn't, um, say, punish you for a particular act, act or action, and that's it in the criminal sense, if everyone did this, well, society just would simply cease to work. And, uh, and another way of looking at this is in terms of honesty and, and telling the truth as opposed to lying. Uh, that idea that, look, if, if everybody lied about everything, there would be no concept of the truth. You'd never know when talking or dealing with other people or organisations whether they were telling the truth or not. And so, again, our entire system just can't work if people don't uphold these notions of duty that can be universalised. Now, another framework to look at in terms of deriving um, particular judicial decisions is this idea of upholding rights. Now, the American philosopher Ronald Dworkin really structured his works around this idea. And uh, again, there is a little bit more to that in terms of the cultural dimension in that judges in America have a lot more recourse to principles from their constitution that they can draw upon making decisions. But Dawkins theory is really grounded on the idea that, look, judges are really and ought to be the upholders of rights. And that rather than, strictly speaking, following all of the, um, the rules expressed by Parliament and all of the doctrines, uh, cases in, that they're bound to in terms of precedent, really judges are picking and choosing things in order to maintain the integrity of the law. And in doing that, it's actually upholding um, the rights of citizens. Now, again, the simple um, sort of response to that that Dworkin certainly addresses throughout his works is that, well, whose rights? Whose rights are we upholding? Okay, sure, we're, we're, um, even if we accept the fact that judges do that, whenever two parties are coming to court, they're only doing that where they can't agree on who has the better claim. The next group of theories that I uh, want to talk about in relation to judicial reasoning are what we sort of broadly describe as virtue theories uh, and virtue ethics. And really the fundamental um, principle of virtue ethics is that we're not really caring about uh, the, un the underlying um, duty or the underlying result uh, that a particular person has in the actions that they do. What we're, we're concerned about is what the attributes of a good person are. And that is, when looking at any particular um, uh, ethical or moral problem, or in our case, a judicial problem before the courts, we're trying to work out, well, what would a good person do in each of these situations? And so we can really look at that in two ways. When a judge is looking at the actors in a, uh, in a dispute, what a good person ought to do in that situation? What are the attributes uh, of a good person? Um, and it also, judges can look at, well, what would a good judge do in this situation? And the results of that may differ quite dramatically from some of these other theories. Maybe it is uh, something when a judge is thinking about uh, what a good judge or a good human being would do in a particular set of circumstances. That might go against um, what our culture is. It might go against uh, what the overall consequences for society are. And I guess uh, on a sort of similar vein, when looking at the um, theories uh, from that flow from, I guess, theological uh, bases, that is, when determining uh, whether a particular action or a particular person uh, has done the right things, to really draw from uh, religious uh, texts and works, and that is from theories that flow from usually uh, Christian uh, derived principles. And so in conclusion on these theories, the divine, the virtue, and on Dworkin and Caleb, there's a, there's a multiplicity. There are many of these theories uh, that are out there, and judges, uh, as human beings, may choose to draw upon those, or they may not. 
from the purposes of this subject. It's just something to draw your attention to. So the next broad um, umbrella term to describe uh, different sorts of approaches to judicial reasoning uh, is really to do with the, I guess, the mode and that judges take on particular roles. Uh, and this really splits into two areas. We, we look at this and describe this concept of legalism. Legalism is where judges really emphasis uh, following established rules and principles to achieve a, a consistent result. Um, legalist judges generally follow, follow precedents and you know, really as a result the law doesn't necessarily develop much. It's, it's conservative in its, uh, in its approach. You may also have heard of this phrase, black letter law. That is, that judges limit their interpretation to the very exact, precise meaning of words. Um, some examples of this are the Barwick Court in the 70s, and in particular so the relationship uh, with the tax office. There were uh, a series of cases where the Barwick Court um, would yeah, basically throw out uh, applications from the ATO. Uh, and really justify these on very, very strict interpretations of the particular statutes giving the tax office power. And many commentators have uh, expressed this as really the Barwick Court and uh, later uh, Gibbs who became Chief Justice really expressing taxation as some form of theft. Whereas we contrast that with the Mason Court uh, from the mid to late 80s, which uh, in essence was much more activist in its nature. The judges really went beyond the, the strict letter of the law and really embraced this idea of that their role is one as a, as a, a mode or method for reforming the law. And so, as well as the Mason Court, as a famous example, I guess, in the entire history of the High Court as being the most sort of activist in its uh, approach to cases, particularly constitutional cases, <laughs> other particular judges, for example, uh, Justice Lionel Murphy, uh, Justice Kirby, and uh, the famous English um, judge, Lord Denning. Now, it's not a, a very straightforward, clear-cut definition. In other words, judges don't usually refer to themselves as either legalist or activist. Uh, in practice, judges really engage in a combination of these approaches in order to, um, to, to resolve particular cases that are put in front of them. And so this final group of, um, of schools of thought uh, are really more grounded in what judges do rather than this high-level modal idea of activism as opposed to legalism. And so these, um, these schools that uh, you can see on the slide in front of you, uh, you may also have been exposed to in courses on uh, statutory interpretation. And it may be helpful uh, to really describe how, and particularly the High Court went about it, interpreting uh, not just statutes but also the Australian Constitution. Um, the history is quite important here because for the first 20 or so years of the High Court being in existence, uh, the judges who were on it were also people that really framed it as well. So there wasn't really any, any dissonance, any difficulty in them trying to work out what the original intent uh, of certain sections uh, was because, well, they were involved in crafting the thing. Additionally, early in the early days of the High Court, a lot of American jurisprudence was drawn uh, upon. And in, in drawing that, there was this emphasis on um, really trying to go behind uh, the scenes and looking at the original uh, intent and again also comparing it to other jurisdictions. Now this really changed in a, a famous constitutional case in 1920, uh, the engineers case. And so uh, aside, you know, we've actually uh, been exposed to the engineers case uh, in other parts of this particular subject, but the another important aspect of the engineers case is really the this, this shift away from using uh, American jurisprudence to really uh, an Australian specific tradition and in doing so the Australian High Court moved towards this idea of really looking at the text itself, this idea of literalism. Hey, 
we're not going to go behind the scenes and try and examine what the founding fathers, fathers were thinking about. We'll just read what the text says. And so this case is also uh, important in terms of statutory interpretation of ordinary statutes and that uh, the, the, the starting point for interpreting a statute is to just go with the normal, natural interpretation of a statute. That's the starting point for trying to resolve its, its meaning. Now, without delving uh, again into great depth of uh, the associated literature with statutory interpretation, this idea of, of following the natural meaning and really using this legalistic uh, approach of just reading text literally was very much um, formed uh, the, you know, the large amount of jurisprudence throughout the 20th century. It wasn't really until um, until the Barber Court where this idea, and certainly the federal and state governments went about enshrining this, this idea of instead of looking to the literal meaning of the text and starting um, and, and really having that as the basis, is really moving towards what the underlying purpose of the statute was. And for those doing stat interpretation, you'll hear this purpose of approach, this being the dominant approach to statutory interpretation. And this is enshrined in the statute in terms of how uh, judges and, and lawyers and solicitors go about uh, resolving ambiguity in statutes by really looking to the purpose of that, that statute and um, where needed re resorting and referring to extrinsic materials to achieve that particular end. However, it's important to note that this was not the way the Constitution was interpreted. And again, that very much followed this idea of uh, looking directly at the text and not going through and looking at the original um, materials and discussing the debates, uh, the constitutional debates of the time and trying to work out what the framers' uh, in intent was. It was very much, very, very legalist, very um, literal interpretations of the Constitution. And that worked um, for you know, the vast majority of the Australian Constitution, which for the most part, it was actually pretty well drafted. I mean, they did have essentially a hundred years of looking at the, how the American Constitution was drafted and that's sort of the difficulties with that, uh, that, as theirs was drafted in the late 1700s, and the Australian Constitution being drafted and then put into effect in 1901, um, they were able to sort of rectify a large number of, uh, of defects that the Americans had. However, there were some problematic areas and one of these uh, was Section 92, to do with interstate trade, where it wasn't particularly well drafted. And in fact, that section, and I, it remains still the most litigated section uh, of the Australian Constitution, was one that successive higher courts really wrangled with. And it wasn't until um, the mid to late 80s when the Mason Court, uh, in this case of Cole and Whitfield, um, which uh, for those that continue with their legal education will be exposed to. It's also known as the Tasmanian Crayfish case, where the High Court actually had to go back and look at the original uh, intent of that particular section in order to try and resolve these disputes. The High Court of Australia doesn't do that lightly. And so, in conclusion on these uh, interpretive um, strategies that judges employ in order to um, to, in order to resolve uh, cases. I think it's useful to just note that the dominant approach of statutory interpretation is to look at the underlying purpose of a particular statute and yet with constitutional matters it's really looking at the text. That's fundamentally uh, the tradition and something that the judges, in particular in the High Court, uh, have followed. So finally, I'll move away from ideologies and judges in terms of their uh, judicial reasoning and move towards uh, the judiciary itself in terms of where it sits in terms of public comment. Because all arms of government uh, in a democratic uh, society can be criticised by members of the public and by other arms of the government. And so it's really that notion that judges themselves are our public officials and they're not completely immune from criticism. Now, historically though, judges don't uh, defend themselves in public forums such as in the media because really to do so is to be drawn into political debate and that's uh, fundamentally the, 
the judiciary is is not supposed to really take sides. It's part of its role is to be impartial. And so there's two mechanisms that I'll just go through and explain in terms of what I guess judges can do, two mechanisms they can use to, I guess, defend themselves in some way. The first is that um, by convention, the person tasked with defending the judiciary publicly and upholding the integrity of the system uh, in the media is the Attorney General. Now, as we're aware, the Attorney General is, uh, is a cabinet minister. So in our Westminster system, it's a person who's been elected as an MP and happens to be in the government of the day and is a, a person who is included in the cabinet and forms, uh, it's one of the ministries, the Department of Justice. The Attorney General is usually referred to, although not in the Constitution, as the third most powerful person um, behind the Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister. Usually the Attorney General um, is the, I guess, the, the next most powerful person in that, um, in that hierarchy. But again, that's by convention. Now, in the state of Queensland, there's been a bit of a, a bit of unusual set of circumstances that that's happened over the last few years. One involved the former uh, Attorney General Jared uh, Blasier, um, the Newman government when they were elected in 2012, and so a, a dispute which um, really sort of demonstrated some sort of uh, almost personal animosity. Uh, was played out in the media between the President of the Court of Appeal and the Attorney General of the day. Now this is very unusual in that, again, by convention, the role of the Attorney General is really to um, sort of defend the, the judiciary. Uh, another controversy that ar arose uh, a few years later was the appointment of, of the Chief Magistrate, uh, Kim, Tim Carmody, to be the Chief Justice of Queensland. Uh, this was mired in, in um, controversy because the judges in the uh, Queensland Court of Appeal uh, actively spoke out um, against this appointment as being, first of all, heavily minded in politics, and also they had grave concerns about uh, his uh, quantity of experience. I mean, essentially, in becoming Chief Justice, he would become the, the highest judge in the state of Queensland. Now, another situation where a uh, sort of breakdown of the convention of the Attorney General defending the judiciary uh, occurs at the federal level often when the federal government lose cases um, when they're trying to legislate in particular ways or take particular executive actions and people apply, citizens apply to the High Court for judicial review and the Commonwealth loses. In those situations uh, in more recent times the you know, Attorney General uh, from time to time uh, speak uh, a little bit ill of the court itself, um, which is a real problem because the court itself, uh, I guess in their public sphere, by convention, doesn't sort of fight back. Now, another area, and it, it, a little related in terms of the inherent power of the court to sort of defend itself in some way, is the idea of contempt. Courts have um, an, an innate, inherent power to hold those involved in court proceedings in contempt. So what does this mean? Well, fundamentally it's about respect. That idea that the court demands respect of citizens. And can, the process of judging people in contempt is just where a judge, um, and it, interestingly, whether a person is directly involved with a case before the court or not, they can be charged if they uh, fail to afford the court the respect that it commands. And so this can commonly uh, play out in terms of people just disregarding orders of the court and um, inside the court and courtroom itself and in and around the court are uh, those showing no respect towards uh, the court and its officials. It's a discretionary power. The courts don't, um, don't use it lightly, but it nonetheless exists and really is the capstone in terms of the ability of the courts to maintain public confidence. Thus, in maintaining confidence in the judiciary, the courts are using their powers really to reinforce the overall legitimacy and authority of our entire system of government.